<laughs> See, I even report misinformation on myself. These wow. Days. Yeah. yeah. Damn. Like there are people that have to fact check stories that I say about me now. So that's <laughs> that's how that's how my life has been. Oh, a whole man. like you know what what do they call that? A, a river of misinformation. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's Miss Mississippi and for Miss. <laughs> Sorry, misinformation hippie. <laughs> Misinfor M I S S I N F O R M A T I O N I S S S I P P I. <laughs> of things on this show but mostly underground experimental sometimes not so experimental music but the important thing is is we review music mm -hmm. music music but no okay so i sort of want to go back to that unless you have something you want to talk about like if you're just like i'm done with whatever your whatever bullshit you're spending I, i'm done man. with all of this i'm sick of <laughs> yes. um <laughs> i was just going to say mm -hmm. And this this has no point whatsoever, but then nice. what does mm -hmm. um, on this show? So mm -hmm. I discovered, I don't know, a couple months ago or something, that there is this fast food chain. It's a Filipino fast food chain mm -hmm. called Jolly Bees. Have you ever heard of this? Mm, no. Mm -mm. So the menu items look, some of them look very interesting. Mm -hmm. Of course, they got the burgers, they got the fries and all this stuff, but they also mm -hmm. have like some Filipino like fast food versions of Filipino food with like noodles and stuff like that. But what they do have that I'm just curious about curious mm -hmm. enough to maybe not try it <laughs> yeah. um, is uh, they have spaghetti, but the spaghetti has hot dogs with cheddar cheese on top. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. anyway, I just thought that that was interesting, and I have huh. no no reason for even saying that. You're just noodling around a little. I'm just noodling around. The sorry spidery to be, sorry to be so cheesy. <laughs> mm. What do you think of that, though? What do you think of the sounds of that? Well, um, I don't know. Yeah, kind of. It seems. Uh, it seems like it'd be really similar to kind of like mac and cheese with hot dogs in it, which I think is good, right? I don't know. Well, I mean, when I was a kid, that was pretty good. I've never, I don't think I've had mac and cheese and hot dogs probably since I was a kid. Hmm. Maybe yeah. in my adulthood at some point. Hmm. I know I ate a lot of ramen noodles. No, also good like, with hot dogs. <laughs> now, see, that, that, I can definitely, I, I don't know if I would mix hot dogs with the ramen noodles though. So what, what's, what, what, uh, what is the flavor no, that don't. is a hot dog attachment? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, chili lime. I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't eat hot dogs either anymore. Well, right, right, right. I eat fake hot dogs. They're good for Maldi. Pretty all right. Like the, uh, mm. are they tofu dogs or are they just like, yeah. The Earth yeah. Balance, I think they're, mm. you know, that brand. Earth Balance, Earth <laughs> Balance. Uh, let's see. Uh, all the vegan products are called Earth. Earth. <laughs> they're just called Earth. Earth Grown. Huh. Wow. Okay. Earth Grown. <laughs> so something about the earth is what yeah. it's okay yeah. gotcha so it's yes. earth burgers earth yeah. burgers and earth dogs yeah earth. dogs of earth dogs that rule the night what's a I, great song off a great album what uh what album is that good god's urge porno for pyros oh okay all right one. it's phenomenal sure. one of my yeah. faves that is a uh that's one i haven't really heard uh mm. before it's um I listened to the first porno for Pyros for mm -hmm. a little while, but that second one, I just remember the, um, I do remember this, the big single that was 
from that one, or I am not what as big as pets. Hundred ways. Tahitian Moon. Tahitian Moon. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really, really solid song. Yeah. I mean, it's a yeah. great album, and the first one's okay, but I think comparatively, they're not even. It's not even like the same band. It's so much more interesting and really well done. Yeah. I mean, the first one's fine for what it is, you know, mm-hmm. just kind of like James White. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that is Pop, basically, you know, like, yeah. I don't know. It's good. Yeah, that is yeah. basically what it is. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it, it, I was just having this conversation with a friend the other day about how Jane's Addiction was kind of the perfect um, transitional band from the... Uh, like glam rock, oh, hair metal sure. to alternative music or punk rock because all Absolutely of that Sunset Strip, all of that Hollywood stuff was still yeah. in Jane's Addiction. Yeah, and uh, they were featured on the soundtrack Dudes, mm-hmm. uh, which almost made my list. Oh, wait, it's a secret. Um, oh, but that whole soundtrack from the movie Dudes by Penelope Spheris, she uh-huh. made, uh, is sort of transitional glam rock to grunge stuff. It's like a whole soundtrack of that weird moment in time. It's awesome. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Well, that would actually be a yeah. perfect transition into. I accidentally let, let the cat out of the bag. The faster <laughs> pussy cat out of the bag. The, fa- the faster pussy cat out of the bag. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that is a perfect uh, transition into what the episode is about yeah and that is soundtracks yeah soundtracks and scores are faves of all time absolutely yes and i gotta tell you i i love soundtracks i think um some of the best albums from the 90s were soundtracks i think yeah the 90s and on yeah, you know I mean? soundtracks are amazing. And it wasn't until we kind of started the idea for this episode that I really started to think about it. And I will go off on this more as we talk, but what a what a great way to learn about the world and a scene and new kinds of music, especially when you're sort of like on a cultural island of sorts, as I felt I was when I was young. Uh, sure. A lot of these soundtracks, at least the ones we uh, that we're going to talk about that I know of, were really like an ambassador for something. Like I don't know how to describe it. It was it was a super fast way to to be immersed in something that you didn't Absolutely. have any idea of before, and that's it's pretty cool. So yeah, I'm 100%. excited to talk about them. So. Same here. And yeah, and the other thing that I think mm. most of the soundtracks, at least that I picked, um, they really operate as like almost like the perfect mixtape in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like uh, it's just, yeah, man, something really, really great about yeah. soundtracks because there are even some of my favorite soundtracks – are even like not necessarily movies that I completely dig, mm-hmm. but the soundtracks are just so good, you know. For sure. And then, and then there's there's also some really amazing movies that may not have the best soundtracks, but because of like on the opposite end, some of the um, movies that maybe are not very good, mm-hmm. they're kind of revamped because of their soundtrack. Sure. Like or, the soundtrack can actually make or break a movie, I believe. Yeah, or it can turn the combination into something that neither the film or the soundtrack could have accomplished on their own. Absolutely. It like becomes a whole new thing. So Absolutely. Yes. I'm sure we'll talk about how amazing they are as we talk about them. So you want me to go ahead and take the lead here yeah, then? Yeah, go for it. Okay, sounds good. I think the first one I'm going to that I'm going to talk about here. This is kind of an obvious one, I think for anybody who knows my personal tastes, and that is the Singles uh original motion picture soundtrack. Now, Singles is a movie that ugh, I got to be honest, I haven't seen in a minute. Mm-hmm. So I'm not really sure if it's aged well. 
I remember kind of liking it when it came out, which, I mean, we're talking about when I was 12 years old. I want to say that part of the reason, in fact, I know a big part of the reason why I liked it was just because it featured appearances in the movie from some of my favorite bands at the time. Pearl Jam was in it. Um, three members, Eddie Vedder, Jeff Amont, and Stone Gossard, uh, played um, in a band called, a fictional band called Citizen Dick mm-hmm. in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Matt Dillon, I believe, or is it Matt Dillon that was the. Yeah, Matt Dillon. Yep, Matt yep. Dillon. He was the lead singer of that band. And then uh, Allison Chains performed in it. I believe Soundgarden was in it. Hmm. Um, I, it's been so long since I've. I kind of wish that I would have watched these movies as well. But uh, you know, I'm just c- kind of going off what I remember. But anyway, I do know that I do know that Allison Chains is in a scene in it. This soundtrack, in my opinion, just perfectly exemplifies what was going on at this time in the sort of mainstream alternative uh music world if you will this is only a year after like Nevermind and 10 the album dirt by allison chains dropped around this time this was like a year before super unknown but a year after bad motor finger screaming trees was putting out stuff i mean all the bands that were on here mud honey became you know, pretty popular around this time. Seattle was kind of like the new LA or whatever. This has literally every band except Nirvana is represented here. So this is like the quintessential 90s grunge uh, motion picture soundtrack, if you will. But there's also a lot of other things on here that are also represented which is what I really like. I think the flow of the soundtrack is really good. Uh, We were just talking about, you know, the perfect mixtape. I mean, I think Mm -hmm. this is perhaps the the best example of that uh, with a soundtrack. It starts off with Wood, which is one of my hands down favorite Alice in Chains songs. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not even a huge Alice in Chains fan. I'll say that right off the bat which that might be a controversial take for some people. Um, But I just, they never were really um, a band that I got into in the same way as Nirvana or Pearl Jam. Mm -hmm. Um, The song Breath by Pearl Jam follows that up, I think really nicely. Um, There's uh, there's a a really cool solo track from Chris Cornell called Seasons. But then what's also really interesting is the inclusion of two Paul Westerberg songs here. Mm -hmm. And I think that the reason why that works so well is because you really realize how much of an influence the replacements were on this whole aesthetic, on this sort of destructive element of the grunge scene, just both in aesthetic uh, presentation, um, I mean, basically, like, in culture, almost overnight, you went from bands that dressed up and put on a big stage show to bands that just looked like they woke up from a hangover the previous morning. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And in the 80s, I think that the replacements perfectly uh, represented that. And so it makes sense that uh, when they were like, okay, what are some other things that we could touch upon that, um, you know, could be included in this like heavily grunge represented uh, soundtrack. And Paul Westerberg, uh, this would have been about the time the replacements were breaking up too. So, I mean, a lot of people say the last replacements album all shook down was basically the first Paul Westerberg solo album. Hmm. And it basically was. So, you know, he got, I don't know, asked to do two songs for the single soundtrack. And I think it works out great. Mm -hmm. Um, Or at least that's what I'm assuming probably was going on. Uh, There's a cover of the battle of Evermore by Led Zeppelin, the love mongers, which uh, is the uh, Wilson sisters from heart. As far as I know, this is like the only song from the love mongers uh, Mm -hmm. because I think heart just continued on. So I don't know if that was, I'm not sure what was going on there. Mother Love Bone, uh, again, a very important band, not one that I really got into, but this is a beautiful song, Chloe Dancer, Crown of Thorns. Now, my favorite Pearl Jam song, at least close to it, State of Love and Trust. 
I mean, I think that's so good. Um, then there's also a Smashing Pumpkins song on here. Screaming Trees is on here. I mean, May This Be Love by Hendrix. Overblown by Mud Honey. I mean, I just listed off all the tracks, but mm -hmm. I just think this is just, this, it's a great soundtrack, and I think it holds up very well today. I think this is a fantastic uh, soundtrack that just holds up very well today. And um, I mean, every song I think is is just really really good and i think the sequence is perfect and i also when i watch the movie the way that it's shot sounds like this album a little bit and i think that that's kind of um important when you're trying to go for a certain aesthetic and sound because you know the visual elements especially in soundtracks are very important when you're considering the music whether it's the score or the soundtrack anyway uh so what did you think of this eric yeah singles uh you're not gonna believe this i think uh -huh. this was the first time i've listened all the way through this soundtrack oh really yeah i um i wasn't very into grunge in 1992 mm -hmm. i uh sure i liked nirvana and um I liked other things that were going on, like Chili Peppers and, I don't know, Smashing Pumpkins and stuff, you know, regular whatever everyone else was listening to. But when I got really into the grunge stuff, I uh, I just didn't feel drawn to it. I don't know. But I knew most of the songs on here just from life. And, uh, yeah, they're really good. I, that season song, like you said, really cool um i don't know it's funny when i listened to it i didn't feel like i had missed out <laughs> which i probably should have felt that mm -hmm. way but it was more kind of like oh you know what this this is really good i probably should have given it more of a chance at the time but yeah it's i liked pretty much all of it and the paul westerberg songs are really cool too they're very telling of what he was about to do with his solo stuff, you know? Um, mm -hmm. The Mother Love Bone song that you mentioned, it's kind of funny because at least the first part of that, it, it's kind of like two songs put together, it looked like. It really reminded me of Jane's Addiction, which is absolutely kind of funny, but I've never really listened to Mother Love Bone either, so I don't know if that's a sound they usually have or if it was that track in particular or, you know, I yeah, I feel like I don't know a lot about that whole scene. Like, I didn't see the movie. I don't know if I've ever seen the movie. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, For whatever reason, I used to be sort of, um, what's the word? A dick. No, I used to be <laughs> sort of uh, not anti-pop culture or whatever's popular, but I didn't always latch on to the things that were popular either. And I didn't really pursue them in a lot of ways. So I think this kind of, for me, fell through the cracks, but I can see how important it is and how influential it is and how as a time capsule, it's pretty much a perfect statement. And yeah, I do find it funny that Nirvana wasn't on the soundtrack. It's almost like they maybe, whoever was making the soundtrack was kind of like, oh, that's too on the nose or something. I don't know. Or maybe they just didn't, maybe Nirvana just didn't let them put songs on the soundtrack. I don't know. But yeah, other other than that, like you said, the omission or the missing Nirvana songs, this is pretty much what I thought was grunge. Maybe like, I don't, I'm trying to think of other bands that, were that I thought of as grunge that weren't on here. I don't know. Tad. I have no idea. So like um but yeah, like I said, as a time capsule, this is very obviously what was happening at the moment. And it's a great representation. And I think you actually get to hear some different sides of things too. Especially like that Chris Cornell song. Uh, you know, I bet it was pretty interesting to be hearing basically an acoustic song by Chris Cornell at that time. So overall, it, I really liked it. And one thing that's kind of funny about the Led Zeppelin thing, uh, they always talk about, well, not I don't know who they are. People always talk about how grunge killed hair metal, right? Like that's just a thing people say. Mm -hmm. I, I've been thinking about it. And especially because of the cover, but also a lot of the moments in it, like 
that Chris Cornell song and some other moments really reminded me of Led Zeppelin. And it's funny because, in my opinion, the family tree of heavy metal basically branches. There's two branches that everything else comes from, which is Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. And so, and Led Zeppelin led directly to hair metal. And so it'd be funny if Led Zeppelin led to hair metal and grunge, the thing that killed hair metal. I don't know. Just a weird observation, but I think there's some sort of connective tissue between all of that. So I, I, I think that that is so accurate. It's not even funny because if you look at like Alice in Chains, for instance, Mm -hmm. this grunge band, they started out almost in the same type of image Mm-hmm. as like hair bands. I mean, they're, they're, mm-hmm. there's like, you know, early photos of them kind of like sort of dressing up, like maybe to look a little more flashy or like Guns N' Roses mm-hmm. or something. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. And then also, if you think about it, like Alice in Chains and Soundgarden were basically already like stadium rock bands. You know what yeah. I mean? Except right. for maybe like the first couple of Soundgarden albums were definitely more on the artsy punk side, but Alice in Chains for sure. Mm-hmm. I think at, at the, and Pearl Jam for that matter, Yeah, at their heart, they were basically like at the heart of their, of their existence in 91, they were almost the furthest thing from punk in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, as far as the punk rock thing in the grunge community, I think it all was, from Nirvana. I think that's where the the punk aesthetic came from. And maybe that's one of the reasons why mm-hmm. this this soundtrack didn't include Nirvana, because maybe, I mean, well, there was Mud Honey on here, but mm-hmm. maybe they were kind of trying to stray away from like that aspect of it a little bit. Yeah. I don't know. It's all it's all confusing. It's like if you were to read the history of like contemporary underground music or whatever, grunge seemingly came in and wiped everything out and was out of left field and came from nowhere. But right. it's like this, it, when I was listening to this, it felt more like a group of people saying, well, hair metal really kind of took Zeppelin and went the wrong way with it. Yep. Let's go back and make it the way we want to do it. I think, I think you that know? that's totally 100% accurate. I mean, yeah, I, I, I can't think of a better way to describe that, actually. So that was just a weird observation. It was it was interesting and to I, go through these yeah. because I had all kinds of new ideas regarding not just the soundtracks and scores, but the movies themselves. Like mm-hmm. it was really fun to to think about these uh, uh, collections and stuff. I don't know. Think about what they represent and what they could mean because. Mm-hmm. When you're young and you're just listening to a soundtrack, you're like, oh, yeah, this song's cool. Oh, this song's cool. You know, like you're sitting around just listening to the Judgment Night soundtrack for days, you know, and you're just like, yeah, House of Pain with, (laughs) I don't even know, Booyah Tribe. Fuck yeah, let's do it. (laughs) At the same time, it's like they really have a cultural impact and it's and it is it's pretty cool. So anyway, I'm going to try to not go off too much so (laughs) i probably will though because it's hard not to yeah you ready for mine so like i said it's gonna be hard not to go off i think i'm just gonna go with fire walk with me by Mm -hmm. angelo battalamente and other various artists julie cruz jimmy scott but they all kind of serve the same purpose i don't think this score slash soundtrack operates in the same way as Mm -hmm. singles does you know i think that i don't think you'd put this in and you'd have and you'd skip through it and you'd be like oh cool this is that julie cruz song like this is more of it's all one giant piece they just happen to be different songs but anyway uh fire walk with me when it came out it really shocked a lot of people uh they couldn't quite get behind the movie i don't think because it stripped everything that the majority of people liked about Twin Peaks and it just stripped away those things and left you with the actual darkness and brutality of the storyline and in my mind serves as one of the earliest prequels that I know of but yeah people weren't that into it because it was so different and disturbing but as a David Lynch movie it is you know it's as disturbing and disorienting as the rest of them but it's uh it's connection to twin peaks makes it, it made it a little different it didn't 
I, it defied expectations. Let's say it that way. That's an easy way to say it. But I do think the soundtrack and the score um, and the sound design added to that sort of differentness. You know, the the show, especially season one, uh, the music's great, but it didn't really venture into strangeness on this level. So, um, but yeah, every moment on this thing is just inspired and deep and uh it puts you in the world of twin peaks um it covers a lot of different ideas like i said there's um dark jazz there's like grinding rock and roll there's torch songs there's sound design and sound collage there's almost like uh in my opinion proto soul coughing with the thought gang song uh real indication uh but they all live comfortably in the same sort of universe and world that's created uh in twin peaks just an untouchable vibe throughout and on a personal note the pink room the track the pink room has influenced pretty much everything i've ever done musically since hearing it i just the ideas behind how that song slash piece are constructed is just really forward thinking and really smart. As far as uh, how a score or soundtrack operates, this kind of changed my mind about what that could mean. And for that reason, yeah, it's one of my favorite ones ever. So what'd you think, Dan? I really, really like this a lot. I really enjoyed listening to it. I've never heard, I've never actually listened to the Fire Walk With Me hmm. uh, soundtrack before. So, uh, however, I've seen the movie several times. And mm-hmm. like you said, it definitely was a whole different take on the Twin Peaks universe, I guess you could say. Or mm-hmm. it definitely, like you said, uh, went in a different direction than what a lot of people sort of wanted it to be i think uh but i th- i mean i i loved it i thought it was a great movie this soundtrack i mean it's it's just a total vibe uh which is pretty much everything that angelo Badalamente, everything that that guy does is a mood i mean mm-hmm. there's like sort of these dark jazz lounge tracks sort of there's definitely some i would say kind of experimental yeah, I mean, sound collage, I can't think of a better way to describe it. it I mean, it sounds like Twin Peaks. <laughs> I mean, that's mm-hmm. straight up. It, it fits the, the aesthetic down to a T, which, I mean, it, yeah, I wish I could add more to it. Um, but if I, I would just say, I mean, if you like the Twin Peaks aesthetic, the Twin Peaks sound, and, you know, the genres that have been explored on not only Twin Peaks, but, I mean, Angelo's stuff on, like, the Lost Highway soundtrack, mm-hmm. the music of the Twin Peaks TV show. It's it's just really great stuff. Some twangy, reverby stuff going on mm-hmm. that I really like. There's always, like, that really just dark, brooding element mm-hmm. to it. Like, it almost sounds like it's building up to something very cathartic and sometimes it does but it just one of the things that i've always liked about the compositions of twin peaks is that it just shows like it's almost like a beautiful nightmare i know Mm -hmm. that that's kind of a weird way to describe it but it's like it it really does show that sometimes subtlety can be super frightening Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> you know, if that makes For any sure. sense, it mm-hmm. really, it, cause it's not scary in like a Gigi Allen type of way or some, mm-hmm. something like that. You know, it's, it's not very confrontational. It's more just like, I almost feel like this music is almost like picking at your, at your brain a little bit and kind of making you sort of, it's, it's picking you up and letting you float a little bit. <laughs> if yeah. that makes any sense. For sure. That's the feeling that I always get. That's always the vibe I get. Nice. Yeah, absolutely loved it. Um, always enjoyed Twin Peaks, and um, I like the shows, and I like the music, for sure. And also, this is also, I think, a perfect example of how the visual and the sonic elements are mm-hmm. equally as important. Like, I don't think mm-hmm. one could really exist without the other. Like, I don't think you could have Twin Peaks without this kind of music. You know what I mean? For sure. It's just, yeah. it's perfect. It's a perfect 
harmony, I guess you could say. Are you ready for my second pick? Do it. Speaking of harmony, um, it turns out that <laughs> two the, my my next two picks, and we'll get to my third pick, obviously. One of them was written by Harmony Corinne, and the mm-hmm. other one was directed and written by Harmony Corinne. This one was written by Harmony Corinne and directed by Larry Clark, and that is the movie Kids, which came mm-hmm. out in 1995. This is a, a, a really disturbing kind of fucked up movie well i wouldn't even say kind of it's it's really fucked up um with a perfect soundtrack um most of the soundtrack is um from the folk implosion which is lou barlow's side project or i don't even know if you could call it a side project because i think it seems to me like he was kind of doing it as his main thing for a while maybe alongside sebado in the 90s when dinosaur was broken up but uh aside from all of that the music on this i think is like a perfect example of like 90s skateboard thrift culture which i feel like stylistically that's exactly what the movie looked like in terms of i don't know you just the the scenes were pretty much filmed in like this gritty sort of way that depicted kids growing up in a really like rough environment but yet they embraced like the 90s like we had a we had a conversation i think maybe it was the last episode about how important beck's loser was mm-hmm. to 90s the 90s sort of culture and how this sort of merging of like hip hop and sort of punk rock and like i don't know thrift store blues or something for lack of a better way to describe it i kind of feel like a lot of that you know folk implosion kind of fits into that a little bit as well i I mean obviously folk implosion were not as important or not as groundbreaking as like something like loser but i mean that's you know this is kind of what happens i think when punk rockers kind of start experimenting with like electronics and samplers and things like that and that's kind of uh synthesizers especially Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what folk implosion was going for um with their music and i think it was the perfect backdrop for what was going on in this movie um which was just it was it was about a bunch of kids engaging in extremely horrible activity or just really degenerate activity um and they were just I, i don't know being being teenagers that were just misbehaving and doing types of things that i guess like a a normal parent would you know would fear that their kids are doing that's that's kind of that's sort of a basic explanation of the movie but for some reason the backdrop of folk implosion uh really worked very well with this there's also um couple of daniel johnston songs which daniel johnston of course kind of outsider-ish type stuff you know worked very well of course there's the famous casper scene in the movie um so both songs by daniel johnston uh initially are about casper the friendly ghost Mm -hmm. there's also some hip-hop like gritty hip-hop on here by a group called uh lowdown the track is called mad fright night and that just sounds like scary 90s you know gritty hip-hop like wu-tang clan type stuff or something Mm -hmm. so there's all these folk implosion songs that are just really cool there's also a track under the name deluxe folk implosion which is very punky and noisy i just i remember the scene was at the very beginning after you know uh the uh main character telly you know has sex with a girl and then just basically leaves and goes and robs this store with his friend and that that song is playing in the background during that scene and i think that that sets up the whole feeling of the movie so mm-hmm. i think it makes a lot of sense that that's the second track on the record mm-hmm. so it's very early in the record as it's also very early in the movie but yeah i think the music is is awesome it's it's great to listen to most of it's instrumental um, I think the the perfect ending to this soundtrack is Slint's "Good Morning Captain." There's just something extremely fitting about that song. For one thing, um, Slint in general is pretty brooding and pretty like you know, kind of I don't know. It represents like the ending to this movie is 
uh, you know, I don't want to spoil it for anyone who might want to go watch it that hasn't seen it. I don't know. It kind of leaves you with like questions on what exactly, what exactly happens. It leaves a lot of things up to the imagination and it's not necessarily comforting in any way whatsoever. So there's not a lot of closure, like, cause you could think, well, okay, stuff happened this way possibly. And that would be really bad. Or, you know, you can kind of make up your own sort of conclusions, I feel. I don't know. That's kind of how Slant sounds in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Just really, like, not comfortable on, like, almost like by design, you know? And I think that's the perfect inclusion for the closing track on this soundtrack. Because you're basically getting a bunch of, like, instrumental sort of DJ tracks, stuff that you might hear like on, uh, it's very reminiscent of like when the Beastie Boys were doing instrumental songs. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of what a lot of this stuff reminds me of. There's also a Sebado song. And then there's this really like, you know, gritty, dark sounding hip hop song. And then before you know it, it's Slint Good Morning Captain. And, you know, a couple of Daniel Johnston songs, which also sounds just a little strange and mm. you know that's kind of how the movie is it's very terrifying very strange and just not very comforting at all and um yeah i i really uh i think that this soundtrack is fantastic so uh, what yeah. did you think eric i forgot how much i listened to this soundtrack actually when i started listening to it i just i knew every Every minute, every second of it, I it was like muscle memory. I, it, this was pretty much endlessly playing in my car for, it had to have been a, a little while, a couple months. Um, I think it's amazing. It sort of like legitimized the movie itself because Harmony Corinne was pretty much just uh, a kid himself at this point. Uh, he had met Larry Clark, I think, at like a skate park or something. Larry Clark was impressed by Harmony Corinne, and so they did this together. And um, when it came out, I think there was a big response to it, and deservedly so, but also it kind of overshadowed, and this happens with not only Harmony Corinne's work, but Larry Clark's work too, the controversy sometimes overshadows how well it's actually done and how thought out it actually is. And I think that happens with kids all the time. It's like people remember a few specific scenes and see it as, you know, this really um, offensive and brutal film. But, you know, there's, there's moments of calmness and reality. And I think, um, uh, I think that's really cool. And I think this music made the movie into, into the full package that it is because they could have won a lot of different ways with the music here. And uh, Harmony Corinne and Larry Clark have both used music in their movies that kind of directs you to feel a certain way about it. And that's great. But with kids, I felt like what they did choose made more sense. It was overall kind of apathetic and drugged out and lazy and this is the music i'm talking about but also that was reflected in the characters and situations in the movie as well like there are really overtly cringy things that happen but for the most part this is presented as reality you know and i think that's pretty interesting but yeah, I, I, at the time, I honestly thought Full Complosion was going to be like the new Beatles. I swear. Like, the songs are so cool and uh, have this, like, apathetic um, confidence to the whole thing, you know? And it it's infectious. Like, it makes you feel cool just having heard it. So, yeah, I love this soundtrack. I had never really known up until this point uh that you know i'd never really known skateboarding to be associated with hip-hop and that's because i stopped skating during the 90s and so it made it seem really current and like urban and like new it was not 
associated with punk rock necessarily and in a culture that my understanding was almost purely associated with punk rock, you know? And so that made it really cool. I just think this movie was super smart and um, really just contemporary, just of the moment, like a snapshot in time. And I think uh, the music helped support those feelings and ideas and made it into more of a a movement than just a movie, I guess. And uh, yeah, I, I, I love it. I can't really say enough about it. So yeah, yeah, good pick. Let's see. So my next choice, let's go with Repo Man. Okay, so Repo Man came out in 1984. It's directed by Alex Cox, I think. I should have written all this down. It is one of my favorite movies. I mean, on any given day, it might be my favorite movie. I might tell you it's my favorite movie, and it is one of them for sure. There are a lot of reasons it's one of my favorite movies, but the soundtrack is is a huge element of that. A lot of times a soundtrack can be sort of an introduction to a world or a lifestyle or uh, even a frame of thought, like a way of thinking and viewing the world. Like, And like I said, if you grew up at a time pre-internet in Iowa, hearing stuff like what's on the Repo Man soundtrack is uh, not common. It's, it's going to be kind of hard to find those things. And so the Repo Man soundtrack was my introduction to a lot of things. I mean, suicidal, fear, circle jerks, that the idea of hardcore basically in general. Um, I thought it was really cool that um, there's a song on there called Iclavo Ila Cruz by The Plugs, which is one of the best songs, one of my favorite songs. And uh, the fact that this uh, had some songs that were in Spanish, um, the plugs also do a cover of Secret Agent Man in Spanish called Hombre Secreto, which is phenomenal. But yeah, so it had this like SoCal skate punk, like lowrider culture element to it. And anyone that knows me knows that I basically just listed my interests. Um, and so they all kind of came from this movie and the movie itself is really fun. It's, it is a science fiction movie because of how, um, removed from our world it is, you know, like all the food is generic and beer just says beer, you know, the, a lot of the punks that Otto uh, runs around with basically look like they're out of, um, like Mad Max or something. There's commentaries on, you know, culture and society. And um, it, I think it had to have been inspirational to a lot of people. Richard Linklater, I think the way he does a lot of um, dialogue and just filming people talking and being a little out there, you know, that happens all the time in this movie. Anyway, this isn't a review about the movie. It's about the soundtrack. But yeah, you got Fear, Circle Jerks, uh, Black Flag, Plugs. All the songs are really fun and really good. Like I said, for me, this soundtrack was like a window to another world, one that I felt connected to, even though I wasn't. You know, I think that happens when you're young. You just find stuff that you want to be a part of. And I was a little late getting into punk and hardcore punk. This movie came out in 1984. I probably saw this movie around 1987. And so, but I got caught up real fast. This was like all the info you needed to head down that path. The songs that they chose are goofy and strange and as intensely irreverent as the movie is. Um, I consider the soundtrack to be one of the main characters of the movie. I don't know how else to say that. So... Anyway, uh, I'll stop going off now. What do you think, Dan? <laughs> well, um, I have a, an interesting uh, admission to make here. I have never seen this movie. Um, I have never seen Repo Man. Hmm. And mm -hmm. what's interesting about that to me is this movie has Emilio Estevez, correct? Yep. 
Emilio Estevez was one of my favorite actors mm. in the 80s. So I don't know how this one escaped me. That being said, mm -hmm. I've heard about this soundtrack left and right. This is like, seems to be one of those movies that the soundtrack is just as popular, if not more popular than the movie itself, or at least it means just as much to people. I've, I've heard about this soundtrack from many people and I got to say, it's a fantastic soundtrack and it's definitely made me want to actually watch the movie and your review of your little mini review of the movie makes me want to watch it. Nice. So I am definitely going to check this movie out. Repo man by Iggy pop is I'm right. I mean, right off the bat. I mean, that, that is just a, a fantastic song. I'm a big Iggy pop fan. Of course, this has Black Flag and Suicidal, who I am very familiar with, both songs too. Yeah, that plug song was very interesting. I really got a kick out of the Burning Sensation song, Pablo <laughs> Picasso. Yeah. That made me that made me laugh. Also, the Circle Jerk song, When the Shit Hits the Fan. <laughs> that yeah, is, as, as a lounge act. Yeah, as a, yeah, as a yeah. lounge act. That's really interesting. Juicy Bananas, Bad Man. I mean, this... It, I can see why this is a, a classic soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, man. If the if the movie is half as good as the soundtrack, then I don't see any reason why I wouldn't love it. Mm -hmm. And there is a possibility that I uh, did see this movie, uh, like in the 80s or something, as a kid, and just never revisited it. I'm definitely interested, for sure. Um, don't know how this one got off my radar, but it <laughs> certainly did. Um, okay, so the next up for me is a movie that is not only written by Harmony Corinne, but also directed by Harmony Corinne. Now, this is, in my opinion, a, fu a, a fucked up movie. This is, in my opinion, this is this is more of a fucked up movie than kids. I mean, it it is one of one of the most messed up movies I've ever seen, but in such a good way. Um, I, I love this movie. I've watched it several times. Um, and basically, like, the short of it is, and again, I haven't really watched any of these movies in a while. Uh, but from what I kind of remember is it takes place in this small town. Everybody in it kind of has some sort of abnormality of some kind or anger issues and they just kind of like are just really destructive and i guess i i'm actually kind of looking it up right now i guess i don't remember this aspect of it but it's set in xenia ohio, ohio. Mm -hmm. and it's a town that had previously been struck by a devastating tornado is what it says here on mm -hmm. wikipedia so um, that makes a lot of sense when you actually like watch the movie. I mean, there's like uh, a kid who, you know, rides around uh, with giant bunny ears. That's one of the biggest things that I remember from the movie. And then there's also like this one part where a guy gets into a fight with a chair at a party. Mm -hmm. And it really, it's, it's really just kind of absurd. Um, but also... I don't know, sometimes frighteningly accurate uh, in a way, like kind of growing up in, around situations like that at times. I, I don't know any better way to kind of describe that. I got to go back and actually watch this movie. But um, the soundtrack represents the movie, in my opinion, because most of this soundtrack is a bunch of metal. And it's not the type of metal that was necessarily popular in 1997 when this movie came out. In fact, it would be safe to say that this soundtrack was most likely my introduction to black metal, power mm -hmm. violence, dungeon synth type stuff. I would say even stoner metal for the most mm -hmm. part, because um, that's really what is on this I mean, for the most part, I mean, the, the record starts off with Absu, which was this Texan black metal band. I believe that they're still around, uh, which, in my opinion, is one of the best metal songs mm -hmm. ever. I love this song. 
that the riff is so i mean just so heavy and then i hate gods on here the electric hellfire club bethlehem which for those of you who don't know bethlehem one of the most just outrageous black metal bands as far as sound burzum's on here even bathory which bathory is i would say the first like three bathory albums are some of my favorite metal music that i've ever heard sleep is on here mortician i remember when that group was super popular brujeria is on here which uh at that time brujeria would have had the sort of folklore surrounding them um which it turns out that they were they were rumored to be like sort of members of the mexican mafia or something uh but it turned out they they were just like members of fear factory and um other bands i think that um were kind of playing in disguise but yeah i mean there's music from this soundtrack plays throughout the movie and scenes that at first glance when watching this movie it it almost doesn't make sense that this is the soundtrack that was chosen for it but then when you start to put things together and you start to realize the combination of what was actually kind of being expressed in the film for lack of a better way to say it and uh what was the situations that people found themselves in throughout the movie um and again a lot of this description is kind of coming off memory it really provides like sort of this insanity that this movie encaps encapsulates but that being said just like kids there there is kind of some moments of you know calmness and mm -hmm. it that's kind of i kind of noticed that that kind of seems to be Harmony Karen's thing. I think mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that he he likes to kind of show the visual side of things to be maybe a lot more interesting or a lot more um like he's got a certain aesthetic that he he applies to things visually. But then when it comes to actual the actual um reality of situations that are actually being expressed, it's kind of almost like I don't know. It feels like you grew up in the town, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, it, that's also perfectly executed with kids as well. But yeah, this is one of my favorite soundtracks of all time. It definitely introduced me to extreme metal music. It, it's really, you know, interesting that the soundtrack came out in 97 when at that point, maybe the heaviest thing I had listened to was corn, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the really black metal wasn't as, I guess, like both stylized and as uh, as popular as as it is now, and so this was a very, I think, kind of a bold choice for like the type of you know musical backdrop that he wanted for this movie, and it ended up totally making sense to me in the end and introduced me to a lot of really cool stuff as well. So yeah, I, I really appreciated that, that this existed. Yeah. Uh, I can't really say much more about it. Um, I think that if you haven't seen Gummo or kids for that matter, I think I kind of put those two movies in a category that everybody should see at least once in their lives. That's my opinion. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, what did you think of this, Eric? Uh, yeah, this pretty much blew my mind in 1997, 98, when I first saw the movie and heard the music. I had heard some things that were kind of similar to this, I guess, by that point. Um, I had the Dope Sick album by I Hate God, and I had heard St. Vitus long before that, but I didn't have any there was no relationship between those things. You know, I was like, well, I hate God. I don't know. It's just really slow. And the guy screams and it's kind of like clutch. You know what I mean? Like it yeah. had a, a swampy element to it. And like St. Vitus was just kind of like slightly slower black Sabbath, but at a time where black Sabbath was still making music. So it was, it was, a, yeah. it was different than like say sleep or something where it was kind of um, re 
imagining something from the past, you know. But anyway, Gumbo blew my mind in a lot of ways. I think when I was young, and I, I think this is probably how a lot of people are, um, the more off-putting and offensive something was, the more I felt like I should latch onto it because it somehow made me more interesting. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, and so I think my, when I first saw Gummo, that was sort of how I viewed it, it was just like this funny, uh, offensive, terrible thing. And since then, I've come to realize that my original view of the whole thing was maybe it was sort of um, punching down, if that makes sense. It was very much like uh, my view of it was it involved, you know, being ableist on some level, um, making fun of poor people, just making fun of weird, challenged people, you know, and now that some time has passed, I don't view it that way anymore. I think the movie, um, I don't know Harmony Corinne's intentions, and I wouldn't even want to try to figure those out. But I do think that um, with this movie, he was trying to show some humanity in those situations as well, which gets kind of lost. But again, I'm reviewing the movie and not the soundtrack. But I do think it's important to see it that way, because even though there are tracks on here that are outsider-ish in nature, like the Destroy All Monsters track. It's really a messed up song. Um, mm -hmm. And like the Jesus Loves Me and the kind of like chicken song at the beginning or whatever, like all of those things sort of lend themselves to that outsider challenged element of the whole thing. And that's okay. But then like when the with the metal stuff that comes in and it's like, this is brutal and this is what's happening is brutal and we want you to feel how brutal it is and how desolate this situation is and how there's nothing but overwhelming boredom and poverty in in this world and i think the heavy metal at parts of that really really sell that you know it's like like when they're riding their bikes and it's like drug and not right. And it's just like, it's intense. And you're like, these kids are on a bad path. They're going to do something wrong that they're, you know, they're going somewhere to do something wrong. And, um, and you get that from the music. It's not even the scene. It's just two kids riding bikes, you know? Um, or if they're whipping a dead cat or something like, the brutality of the situation is real. And I think the music reinforces that. So, uh, but yeah, uh, I haven't listened to this soundtrack in a long time and it was actually a little more diverse than I remember. Um, especially the electronic tracks on there, the dark Nord track is really forward thinking. Like, absolutely. It's like an apex twin song, mm -hmm. but glitchier. Like, I think it's glitchier than, what Apex Twin was doing at the time. I don't know for sure, but, um, and then Na Namanax track as well is really cool. Um, and even though I sort of made that uh, Destroy All Monsters track sound terrible, it's also really terrifying in its own way. So, but yeah, it's really cool. I'm not sure if Harmony Corinne found all this music or if another like, production designer i don't know how they found all this stuff because like you said this wasn't really very popular um right at the time this was my introduction to my understanding that stoner and doom was a scene sure you know what i mean i i had just thought oh there's these random weird bands that sort of had this sound to it um sure and all of a sudden it was like oh shit this is this is a thing this is sure. something that's happening it was an ambassador for doom this spread the word of doom metal to the united states at large and probably the world on some level um, absolutely which is cool um the movie would like i said wouldn't be half as brutal and sickening and 
complicated, um, disconcerting. Like there's moments where you truly are nervous about what you could possibly be about to see. And that's interesting. And sometimes it delivers and you do see things that you probably won't ever get out of your mind. But a lot of times it's more just that building tension. But yeah, I I think Gummo is a really great movie. And like I said, I think for a long time, I thought it was cool because it was so disturbing. Mm-hmm. But now I think, you know, I do think there's a story here. And I, yeah. And I've been to places and trailers and homes where you do get drunk in the kitchen and you do destroy chairs and you do fight your family members. And, you know, like all the Mm -hmm. things in the movie are very real. And that's um, hard to watch at times, but it's also a reality that we can't really shy away from, even today. I don't think the movie loses any of its uh, relevance now. You know, I think you could watch it and still think, man, this is pushing some boundaries. But yeah, I'll get more into this when I get into my uh, honorable mentions. But for me, this soundtrack and movie very much reflected and were kind of a modern, more modern counterpart to a movie called River's Edge, which I will Mm, talk more about. Very similar in in certain ways. And uh, real quick to speak on um, what you were talking about as far as like bringing the movie was kind of bringing humanity, as you put it, Mm -hmm. into some of these situations. That's kind of what I was meaning by when when I said in my initial quick review about how a lot of, like, these situations, you you kind of feel like you grew up in the town when you watched Mm -hmm. it. And you, you know, when I said that it's not too far off from some of the situations that I grew up with, Mm -hmm. because you really did see people who were had these struggles Mm -hmm. and i think in the 90s it was super easy to as you put it be more ableist about things because there wasn't really a lot of awareness Mm -hmm. brought to um those type of struggles as -hmm. there is now and you know that it's growth but it's also i think society and how they how society views things and how it presents things. Mm-hmm. And in the nineties, it, it just wasn't there. So it's, um, it's really interesting how much that aspect has evolved mm-hmm. and how this movie, as you said, in a lot of ways has aged well, simply because of the way. And in fact, in that way, I would say that this movie was kind of forward thinking in that mm-hmm. sense, yeah. because it was really kind of saying, Hey, look, people have these struggles, you know, Mm -hmm. take whatever you want from that information. But, you know, this is really what's happening a lot of times Mm -hmm. in these small towns. And that's, it's a pretty amazing thing when you think about it, something to really like, uh, you know, put out there in 1997 as a work of art, pretty Mm -hmm. remarkable when you think about it. Yeah. Very brave. That's for sure. Absolutely. If not um, slightly misguided, <laughs> slightly misguided, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, and and it was. I mean, I still do think. I mean, it because of the way it makes me feel, more or less. It is. It does. It like you said. It has parts that are deeply disturbing and is mm-hmm. a messed up movie. Like th- there's just no way, no way around that. But mm-hmm. it at the same time, I totally agree with you that it's also a dose of reality. And that's, that's something that um, I'm, I'm realizing now having this conversation with you, Eric, that Mm -hmm. Harmony Corinne is really, really good at in his movies. For sure. So that's yeah. Pretty incredible. Harmony Corinne, man. I I would recommend checking out his movies for sure. Okay, cool. So speaking of disturbing movies with some redeeming value. (laughs) um, Yeah. My next pick is a Taxi Driver a score by Bernard Herrmann. This movie was directed by Scorsese. This is probably my favorite score of all time. It's hard to even 
for me to even talk about why it's so impressive. And there are a lot of scores that I love and a lot that didn't even make my list. Um, but this one stands head and shoulders uh, above. And I think it's because it's pretty much the deepest and headiest score I've ever heard. Like you are completely immersed. And the movie is one thing, uh, which I'll talk about more in a second, but the score stands alone um, as far as I'm concerned and could be its own thing. The fact that it was made for a movie is just kind of a plus, but overall it's brooding and sultry and contemplative, atmospheric, kind of shocking and startling at times. And that's the score I'm talking about. I think those same ideas could be applied to the movie as well. So if you don't know what Taxi Driver is, I'll give you a real quick rundown. When I was younger, I liked Taxi Driver quite a lot more than I do now. And I still think it's pretty good. Actually, I think it's really good, but some aspects of it really have started to, I don't really jive with. They don't. I don't connect with them and I don't necessarily want to connect with them. Um, it has a bit of a incel feel to it. I just personally don't really um, connect with or relate to um, the violence and sort of um, the obsessive nature of stalking someone and just things like that. I don't really enjoy seeing those things. So, but with that being said, Taxi Driver is a classic amazing performances by everyone, obviously, De Niro and um, Harvey Keitel and Jodie Foster. It is really a, a beautiful looking movie. It's atmospheric and uh, disorienting in how slowly it moves and then quickly terrifies you. Uh, yeah, it's a cool movie. Um, but yeah, Travis Bickle is a guy. Uh, he drives taxi late at night because he can't sleep. And he becomes obsessed with, well, two people, really. Uh, underage prostitute and a uh, lady that works at a bank, I think, or the newspaper or something, a professional. Uh, slowly loses his mind and uh, violence ensues. So with that being said, an interesting element to this that I never pieced together until I was listening to it this time around. Um, well, I'll get back to that in just a second, but overall the music is pretty traditionally based in like orchestral score ideas. A lot of um, just super normal classical score type elements, but then there's some other really strange diversions and, and movements. Um, Instrumentally, uh, it's saxophone, vibraphone, electric piano, jazz drums, uh, upright bass. So overall, pretty jazzy. Um, but then other instrumentation gets kind of crazy. There are sounds that in contemporary sort of indie music or whatever are pretty commonplace, but at the time hadn't really been heard except maybe in pet sounds. But yeah, back to the interesting thing I noticed. Um, this also has a lot of marching snare and bass drum and bugle and sounds like that. And they pretty much permeate the whole score. And I never really put that together that maybe, and this might be something common that everyone knows about or thinks about, but for me, I never really thought about the subtext of uh, Travis Bickle probably being a vet, like a Vietnam vet, and the PTSD element of this story and how that militaristic music sort of keeps bubbling up to the surface of these pieces, it sort of just made me think about how that could could and probably is a major subtext and um, secondary story to this movie. And so it's just like that element that you just keep finding things within this score that make you realize how deep the psychology of this music is and how it relates to the mu the movie. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think there would be 
the fire walk with me soundtrack without this i don't think a lot of the stuff i like would have the same feel um at, that it does without the taxi driver score so um i love it and i don't have a lot else to say about it what do you think dan so i'm gonna make another confession i've never seen taxi driver hmm. which may blow your mind um Again, this is another movie that um, I've heard a lot about. Um, that being said, I loved this score. Mm -hmm. um, all the same things. Um, I don't really have much to add to the conversation. Um, jazzy, a lot of, as you said, there was definitely a heavy marching drum element to it. Uh, definitely some really cool noises, upright bass. You know, parts of it kind of gave me uh, like a Tom Waits kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think it would have been too bizarre to hear Tom Waits coming in, you know, on one of the songs yeah. at times. Or like the song Evidence by Faith No More. You know, kind of that sort of almost like detective music feeling sure, or something right. in a way. Yeah. And um, but that's interesting that uh, he was a vet because mm -hmm. I could totally see how that is this type of music and that approach could play an integral part of the story. I, I really liked it. I think I would not be surprised if some of the more orchestral groups like Tristezza or, or God, mm -hmm. even like Godspeed should sure. have been influenced by this mm -hmm. score, you know, cause there's, there's some elements that is almost like proto that proto yeah. like indie instrumental orchestral stuff, whatever you want to, label that stuff uh but i also think it's obvious to me that twin peaks is a huge influence on that stuff mm -hmm. so it would totally make sense to me that angelo metalamente i could totally see where he probably was inspired by this score 100 mm -hmm. percent, because it definitely had that same sort of dark brooding feeling like something was gonna come to the surface and explode but it never quite gets there you know mm -hmm. sort of thing although it does it does in some parts i guess but it's it's a pretty a pretty interesting listen for sure i i really enjoyed it so nice um i guess i'm gonna have to put this one on because uh, i would i am interested in seeing how this applies in the context of the actual movie yeah. again it's a movie that just was not on my radar and yeah. for whatever reason i'm sure several people are probably going to hear this and be like you've never seen repo man and you've never seen <laughs> taxi driver but you know it's it's mm -hmm. it's just one of those things yeah you know it happens we can't we can't take in every single thing that exists no it's impossible absolutely and and i and i'm sure that um i'm gonna get to them you know at some point in my life sure. you know so well luckily we have forever so we have forever exactly. I mean, until we don't <laughs> yeah all right so here are my five honorable mentions uh number one the first teenage mutant ninja turtles soundtrack no surprise to anyone <laughs> Came out in 1990. I listened to this thing, obviously, over and over again when I was a kid. Uh, yes, most of it is kind of, you know, a little a little cheesy. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it does have This Is What We Do by MC Hammer. That was kind of the big hit. Uh, Spin That Wheel, High Tech 3, which I legitimately love. Turtle Power by Partners in Crime. I, I feel like a lot of these... Because this was kind of around the time that the New Jack swing thing was hmm. kind of going on. You know what I mean? I feel like some of these were just like studio made up in the studios. Mm -hmm. Like I, like I'd never heard of Partners in Crime. I don't know. They may have put out an album. 9.95 .9 by Spunkadelic. But what I really like on this is there's actually some orchestral pieces like Shredder Sweet and Ninja Thieves by John Duprez, Splinter's Tale 1 and Splinter's Tale 2, Subway Attack slash Foot Clan, and Shredder's Big entr Entrance slash Crime Empire, which both I would almost say would qualify in the same realm of like the Taxi Driver soundtrack. Maybe not that, well, definitely not that brilliant, but still some really, really great music, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. That's And then also... Uh, uh, kind of a another honorable mention here. Ninja Turtles 2 Secret of the U's had Ninja Rap by Vanilla Ice. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
my second honorable mention, Lost Highway, Angelo Badalamenti. So many great tracks on here. This almost made my top three. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Deranged by David Bowie, The Perfect Drug by Nine Inch Nails. One of my favorite Smashing Pumpkin song, I. Mm -hmm. uh, this Magic Moment by Lou Reed, Apple oh, of Saddam beautiful. by Marilyn Manson. I Put mm -hmm. a Spell on You by Manson. It's got Rammstein. Mm -hmm. uh, some, this is kind of the sort of like the beginnings of Trent Reznor doing his instrumental score type stuff. Mm -hmm. But all the stuff from Angelo Badalamenti on here is just as haunting and just as beautiful as Twin Peaks Firewalk mm -hmm. with me. Highly recommended. I love this soundtrack. Number three is the Not Another Teen Movie soundtrack. Not a movie that I'm particularly interested in, but what I do like about this is it uh, features a bunch of bands from this time period. A lot of these bands, I'll be honest, I wasn't necessarily into. But, you know, you got like Tainted Love by Marilyn Manson, which is an okay cover. Never Let Me Down Again by Smashing Pumpkins, really good. Blue Monday by Orgy, which I always liked that cover. Uh, Bizarre Love Triangle by Stabbing Westward. They did a pretty good one. 99 Red Balloons by Goldfinger. Uh, Somebody's Baby by Phantom Planet. So, I mean, this is basically just... It's like late 90s rock, mm -hmm. but the entire thing deserves to be on this list, in my opinion, because of System of a Down doing a cover of Berlin's The Metro. Oh, Hands yeah. down the best thing on the entire. And just that alone, I think, makes the soundtrack worthy. Okay, now I may have broken some rules on my last two picks, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know, probably not. Uh, there are soundtracks to music documentaries. Fagazi Instrument Soundtrack. Not only is it an amazing documentary that changed the way I viewed being in a band, the instrument soundtrack is kind of more of a leftover, unfinished, scrapped album from Fagazi, it feels mm -hmm. like. However, it's not, it's not even really that because it's so unfinished that it literally is just like, some of them are like skeletal demos of songs that will appear on later albums. But there's a couple of tracks on here that are have become over time sort of classic Fagazi tracks. There's like three songs with vocals, and that's Little Debbie, and then also I'm So Tired, which is a beautiful, this sounds really weird, but it's a beautiful piano track with Ian McKay doing the, it's the closest he's ever come to like, actual singing like it's it's really really good mm -hmm. and it's not even the closest that he comes he, he actually is singing on it it's really really good stuff um it's mostly instrumental stuff so i will say there is that sort of element where it's kind of for i would say real fans only you know mm -hmm. kind of i i don't know i i would definitely not start with this for a vagazi record that's for sure i think it, it would be nice to have kind of a reference point of like Fugazi's work before you hear this, but it really pairs well with the overall feeling of the movie. There's some really brooding instrumental stuff on here. And I think it just shows how great of a band Fugazi was. And then number five, another soundtrack to a, uh, well, this is kind of a, an, a documentary on the Seattle scene called uh, Hype. And this just has a lot of music from the bands that were featured. And it really digs deep into the Seattle, I don't even want to say grunge, because this really digs way beyond grunge. Like, you got stuff by the Fastbacks, the song K Street, which those guys were a lot like um, sort of Ramones-influenced, like pop punk, but kind of in the 80s, Wipers. You Men, Green River, but it also has Soundgarden, Mudhoney, Nirvana. But then it digs really deep and gets into like Some Velvet Sidewalk, Seven Year Bitch, The Gits, Flop, The Posies, uh, Mark Lanigan's on here, Pigeon Head, all kinds of stuff. Young Fresh Fellows, Gas Huffer, Dead Moon is on here. Just a really, really great documentary that... Uh, you know, it, it was released in 96, so yeah, it's pretty outdated now, but still really fun to watch and to, you know, this got me into a lot of a lot of different music that I probably wouldn't be into today had I not seen this documentary or heard this soundtrack. So nice. that's my five honorable mentions. Cool. 
All right, I'll go through mine real quick. Uh, first and foremost, uh, this one just barely didn't make my top three. And honestly, after I told you, Dan, what my top three were, I I kind of wanted to change this one to one of the top three. Anyway, it is the River's Edge soundtrack. Um and also the score by Jurgen Kneiper. It's not included on the soundtrack, but I just wanted to mention that the score is amazing as well. Um, River's Edge is probably one of my favorite movies. I mean, it is one of my favorite movies ever. Uh, for whatever reason, I'm way into um, rebellious youth movies, uh, always have been. So a lot of uh, different movie scores or, or soundtracks almost made my list. And because of what they are and they're all kind of in that sort of same sort of movies i guess like uh suburbia or thrashing over the edge like you know just kids in rebellion but none of them really stack up against river's edge it is while gummo might be a little more overt and uh brutal in its own way river's edge is terrifying in uh how apathetic the kids are in the movie um it is even slower and more uh pensive than gummo but yeah it's about a group of kids uh one of uh, the old metal heads headbangers or whatever one of them kills his girlfriend and the rest of the group has to figure out how they're gonna navigate through this situation um it has dennis hopper in it dana roebuck um keanu reeves uh crispin glover in what i think is his best role as lane it's a phenomenal movie but like i mentioned before i do think gummo had to have taken some uh aspect of influence from this movie um not only does it show these kids in their sort of natural state but it also sets it to extreme metal music um this was my introduction basically to speed metal and thrash metal. I had heard um, Metallica because Metallica was pervasive at that point. You couldn't not hear Metallica. But this is what got me from hair metal into speed metal and thrash was hearing this record. And uh, the movie and the soundtrack had a huge influence on all kinds of people. Phenomenal movie. Uh, a little off-putting uh, at times, for sure, but super good. Next one is the Clockwork Orange score mm -hmm. slash soundtrack uh, by Wendy Carlos. I won't go into this too much. Uh, it's Wendy Carlos doing classical pieces on the synthesizer. There's a couple of other sort of songs within it. This one uh, it means a lot to me because... Uh, it's a record I used to get from the Musser Public Library. I go into more detail about that on the episode about Sean's records. But yeah, you're not going to do much better than this. Although I will say this one just barely beat out The Shining. Um, also a Kubrick movie, also Wendy Carlos doing the score. Just phenomenal. Anyway, uh, the next one is uh, the Pump Up the Volume soundtrack from 1990, uh, starring... Christian Slater, he runs a uh, pirate radio station out of his house. He's very cool, very cool guy. Um, but anyway, like with most of my picks, this was my introduction to things, and that's why it, I hold them in high regards. Uh, whereas Repo Man kind of got me into punk rock, River's Edge got me into thrash. Pump of the Volume, for the most part, really did introduce me to what would become alternative or indie music or whatever. And it was sort of pre grunge. So you didn't have those like singles is, uh, you know, a, a later thing, even though it's maybe just one or two years later, uh, I feel like uh, pump up the volume was trying to scrape up whatever weird, interesting music they could and make a scene out of it, which is interesting. Uh, but yeah, you have your wave of mutilation, the good version is what I call it, uh, by the Pixies. I'm not sure if I had heard the Pixies before this or not, uh, but could easily be my introduction to the Pixies, my introduction to uh, the Descendants, 
Uh, the song Kick Out the Jams is covered by Bad Brains and Henry Rollins. I didn't know about MC5 before that. Uh, Sonic Youth, I don't think I had heard before this soundtrack. So uh, there's a cover of Everybody Knows by Concrete Blonde. I don't think I knew who Leonard Cohen was, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, really just a big influence on me, I guess, personally. Uh, the next one is... Um, That's a great pick, by the way. It's... I don't know about the movie. I haven't seen it in years. I assume it's probably bad, but the mm -hmm. soundtrack's pretty good. Um, yeah. The next one is It Follows uh, by Disaster Piece, who I've never listened to before or after the It Follows score, but um, it blew me away. I went, I went to the movies to see It Follows. It's a really cool movie. It's like a, it's a horror movie, but it's sort of like a new slow burn type horror movie and the score is just crazy and i had not heard much music like that and i definitely had not heard it as the score to a movie it doesn't really follow any sort of song structure or patterns or repeating themes it's more just experimental sound design and real synthed out synth wave stuff and for you know Coming out in 2014, that stuff was actually kind of forward thinking. So uh, my last choice is um, The Virgin Suicides Score by Air. Uh, came out in 2000. Virgin Suicides was directed by Sofia Coppola, I believe. Um, it's great. It, it really made me rethink what a score was. Um, there are reoccurring themes like a standard score, but every track has its own mood. Um, and I, what I really like about it is, I mean, among other things, Air uh, comes into this uh, in a way different way. I'm not sure if the follow-up to Moon Safari had come out before this or not, but compared to Moon Safari, this is so different. Um, this is more like rock. This is synth rock, um, like uh, Wish You Were Here, Pink Floyd, like guitar solos, big synthesizers but there's a lot of really subtle things happening too it's just as far as scores go just really cool um mm -hmm. and yeah i guess that's my honorable mention list that, that's awesome dude um i i gotta say i actually watched pump up the volume not that long ago yeah and uh i still enjoyed it actually cool uh, myself we covered a lot of shit today we really did that was a, a information yeah. heavy episode i don't think we were funny at all hardly um, hardly at all i mean i didn't find us funny i, I mean i never <laughs> do but right right uh, but yeah no we packed a lot into this short amount of time so uh, i don't know maybe it should have been two episodes so we could bullshit and, and be funnier <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> But hey, what do you? Uh, oh well, we can be we can be funny now. Mm, uh, nope. <laughs> okay, I feel yeah. There's like a there's a certain time limit for being funny, and it kind of yeah. expires eventually. You know what yep. I mean? Yep. So and there it goes. Definitely one of those <laughs> things for sure. We'll be funny next Definitely time. Definitely one of those times. Yeah, we'll be funny next time. We promise. Hey, we yeah. got uh we got like we're gonna be coming up on our hundredth episode soon. So like pretty soon. We gotta be funny on that one. Oh yeah. A yeah. hundred times we're gonna, funnier. We're gonna be hilarious. We're gonna be so funny that you're gonna cry mm. when you hear us. You're gonna be crying, you're gonna be laughing, you're gonna be jumping around and telling your friends about it. Wow. Yeah, you might even throw a bunch yeah. of silverware in the uh, microwave and blow up your kitchen. You're so gonna, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, yeah, things are gonna catch on fire. <laughs> it's gonna be great. You're gonna burn down your school. Let's Beautiful just, thing. <laughs> talk about all the, the <laughs> cool things that happened. All the things, all the things movies. that we wanted. Oh, uh, I was actually, so your first pick over the mm. edge, was it? River's Edge. Yeah. River's Edge. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So I thought I had heard that movie before. And I thought that 
Kurt Cobain once said that that was his favorite movie. Mm, and I looked it up that. while you were talking about it. Yeah. But it actually is not. It's the movie Over the Edge. I love Over the Edge too. That almost made yeah. my my honorable mention. That that was, was my introduction yep. to Cheap Trick for sure. Yep. Like yep. Surrender. It, it's one of one of my favorite songs. Again, if you ask me on a certain day, I would say it's my favorite song. But over the edge is cool. Like cars are on it. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know who else. Alice Cooper, maybe. Alice uh, Cooper, yep. Generation yep. Landslide. No, that's on Dogtown and Z Boys, which almost also made my list. So <laughs> I had a hard time. Yeah, there were a few. Yeah. Same here. I had like I could have just picked my like, top five favorite uh David Lynch scores, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Is amazing. Yeah, I had like um Mall Rats, that was a mm. soundtrack mm-hmm. I listened to all the time. Uh, yeah. Wayne's World, that was a soundtrack mm. I listened to all the time. Although I'm not sure if that one aged aged as well. But uh, yeah, there, there were so many of them. So many yeah. of them. Wow. Uh, but well, yeah. we'll have to revisit it then. We'll do it again. We will have to. Maybe we can do a part two or something. Nice. At some point. So yeah, we learned about fast food today. And that's pretty much... That that was the goal of the episode, right? Yeah. Welcome yeah, to the Wiener food. Schnitzel. Can I take your order, please? <laughs> I've never actually yeah. been to a Wiener Schnitzel. Me neither. I only know it from Pump Up the Volume. Yes. Oh, that's right. It was in that movie, too. Yeah. yeah. It's also in Dumb and Dumber, I remember. Oh, really? Wow. He ordered a big hot dog for the dog in that dog van. Oh, man. In the beginning. Yeah. Sounds good, <laughs> doesn't it? Um, <laughs> but only in spaghetti. Yeah, in spaghetti. They salt. they gotta chop it up. Anyway, thank you for listening, everyone. <laughs> wow. All right. Yeah. All right. Y'all have go a good watch one all now. these movies. I mean, yes. What else, what else do you have to do? You're not busy. Yeah. What else do you got to do? It's if not you're like listening busy, to this. Busy. You got time to kill. Let's be honest. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is true. Uh, well, thanks, yeah, for right. listening. Check us out on Instagram and uh, what else? Facebook and YouTube. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Let me tell you something. I only got one law. A kid who tells on another kid is a dead kid.